Welcome to Psychedelic Radio. I'm Christina Thomas, the president and founder of Myself Wellness, and my co-host is Charles Patty. Together, we co-founded the Warriors of Consciousness, a not-for-profit to help people gain access to psychedelic ketamine therapy. Together, we are on a mission to help save and transform lives through this treatment. In this podcast, we'll be pushing boundaries, breaking taboos, and shedding light on the use of psychedelic medicines. We want to share expert knowledge and firsthand accounts of those who've experienced transformative psychic shifts using psychedelics. Journeying with us today on this edition of Psychedelic Radio is Masha Tai. Masha is currently working with ACS Laboratory. She is helping the business with cannabis, hemp, and psychedelic compliance. Masha stays on top of legal, scientific, and product development, helping drive corporate growth and education through client acquisition and retention. Recently, Masha was part of the founding team of a psychedelic telemedicine platform. She continues to mentor, guide, and explore new avenues in the psychedelic research, analytic, analytical testing, integration, and set and setting. She's been featured on a variety of different media outlets and has participated as a speaker in multiple events and conferences. Hey, hey Masha. Masha. Hi, how are, how are you? you? Thank you really? so much for being on the show with us today. Thanks for having me. So the the first question that I always ask people on the show is what sparked your passion in this field? What what got you into this? What were you uh what ignited that flame within you? Well, um I've been in the cannabis industry for a while and what sparked that passion was that I mean I've always been a huge advocate of the plant. And um, I was in corporate America for many years. I've had a successful career. Nothing really felt quite right. Like I liked it. I didn't love it. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't my calling. Um, Ten years ago, I got sick and I used um, Rick Simpson oil uh, with, uh, you know, other modalities and everything to heal. And I did it, you know, illegally because it wasn't. Um, at the time, I mean, in Florida at the time, cannabis was not legal. And so having to smuggle in the medicine, fight for my right to choose my treatment, and all while being so stigmatized, that really, um, it inspired me to make sure and then seeing it work, right? So within a couple months, it worked. There were no, you know, literally there were no instructions. It wasn't tested. It was all based on trust and a community of healers that made sure that people who were sick could get the medicine. And at that point, you know, it really, I, I just realized like nobody should be sick and have to fight for their right to treat themselves and then wonder like, is this good medicine? And so I didn't know what that was going to look like as far as getting, you know, into cannabis, but I, I knew somehow that would be my path and then years later you know I've always been really interested in psychedelics and plant medicine and I know I knew that it was beyond just having fun with it that there was something really um, powerful and it was just a matter of figuring out like how to navigate through it and so um, I sat in an ayahuasca ceremony, I think the first one was four or five years ago, and that really opened me up to myself, this life, the past life, the plants, everything, you know, ayahuasca is such a strong medicine and it, it gives you messages. The ayahuasca actually told me to go into cannabis. Um, it told me, you know, it told me many things. And, and so it's one of those things you kind of, as you start to listen to it, you start to really what you're listening to is your inner voice and you have, you start to gain more confidence in your gut and in knowing that we are guided. And as, as soon as you put your truth out there, others that, you know, others will be drawn to you. Once you speak your truth, then you attract those that, that are aligned. And so it was just one of those, you know, one thing led to another. I started doing events in cannabis, um, uh, educational events, women's cannabis wellness events. This was like four years ago. No one was really talking about cannabis wellness. So those two words in California, Colorado, sure. But again, you know, in Florida, it was so new. And so it was like every step led to the next step. Every person led to the next person, every event, every speaking opportunity. It just built. I didn't necessarily know where it was going to 
go, but you know, it's really about the journey. So I'm very fortunate to work uh, with ACS Laboratory. They're, they're a client of mine. I mostly work with them just because there's so much to do in terms of education. And um, because we're DA licensed and we're CLIA licensed, which means we can do human trials and um, pharmacokinetic studies, which is like where you look at urine, blood, or saliva for the presence of these analytes. So it's, you know, we can test the plants, the fungi, we can test the, um, the bioavailability of it, the potency of it. I mean, it's just, there's so much to do. And now that mushrooms, uh, you know, obviously are becoming decriminalized, opening up in Oregon and in Colorado, there's, we just, you know, it's just the next thing, next thing that's, that's really, so. Yeah, that was a long answer, but I, but, I love it. I love it. Yeah, it was amazing. I know. I feel like we've we've known you for so long, and I just I never knew that that story, and so I really appreciate you sharing all of that with us. Yeah, you know, yeah. for the for the listeners out there, one of the we actually were introduced to Masha through a mutual friend, and one of the first times we actually all got together was for what I know to be like the first doctor sanctioned like K-tation or Keditation, whatever, you know, yeah. the label you want to put it. But it was basically a group of us that and this was before my psychedelic journey had ended, actually. So we all sat in a healing circle with the intention of, you know, having this really therapeutic session together where we were, you know, not only trying to heal ourselves, but also, you know, get together to put positive energy out into the universe to help heal humanity. And, and boy, what a beautiful day that was, there was so much energy flying around. And it was just such a great experience. So like, we were that that was actually like at our facility right when we first had yeah. opened and, and what a great connection that truly was. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, we all knew that great things were coming. We felt it. And that's, 100%. That's just, what you guys it. have done in such a short amount of time has been like, it's nothing short of a miracle, you know, but when you have that collective energy and that collective intention, it's just, you can, there's so much you can do. No, for sure. I've listened, you know, like, I, I, I know, you know that, but I'm a huge believer in manifestation and, and putting polarities out into the universe. But the truth is, is that, you know, of course, without action, manifestations don't take place, but it's also tuning into these higher vibrational frequencies where it really starts to make things come to fruition. So well, and listening to your higher self, just like you talked about yeah. how the ayahuasca told you, you need to be in ketamine. I mean, in ketamine and cannabis. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, for sure. No, I love tuning it. into that. No. Yeah. So, so, um, question would be for the next question would be, tell us some of the work that you guys are actually doing over at, um, ACS. Yeah. So what we've been doing for the past year, it's been actually a little bit longer than a year. So, you know, we saw, we saw what was happening, you know, with mushrooms and as far as cannabis goes, because we've been testing cannabis, um, since 2017, but before that, we were a toxicology lab um, since 2008. So we're a clinical laboratory operating in the cannabis space, which is quite different because many labs kind of just pop up as cannabis labs. But when you're a clinical laboratory, the instruments that you have are very sophisticated. The methods are proven. And just by um, doing some of this stuff for so many years, uh, you know, you develop proprietary methods to test the potency of certain drugs. So that set us up to um, be able to innovate. So when a new cannabinoid comes to the market, so everybody knows about THC, CBD, CBG, but then there's new ones that pop up all the time, right? So like THCP, which is supposed to be 30 times more potent than cannabis. So be, because the caliber of the laboratory, we're able to source they're called certified reference standards, which is the standard for that material. It's that material itself at the highest form that's certified, made by another lab, right? So we receive those standards and then you calibrate the instruments and you set up the methods at, against which you test the products, right? So that's kind of a simplified way. We were able to source um, the standards for all of these tryptamines. And that's not easy to do. But again, when you start out as a, um, a clinical laboratory, you have access, you know, to different, to much different channels. And you have the ability 
to scrutinize certified reference materials. So that's also another thing that's very important. And a lot of people say, well, why do some labs have certain results? Other labs have other results. They vary. Likewise, it's not just what they're doing in the lab at that time. It's the quality of their reference materials. And it's, they're expensive, you know? And so this development takes a while. And so when you're developing, so think about this, would you ever develop a product without knowing that there's a market for it? You know, mm -hmm. most people, you don't do that. You're like, okay, well, you shouldn't, um, you know, you have to look, you, you have to look at, well, what are the distribution channels? How am I gonna get it out there? Are there any buyers? So when we're doing this for psychedelics, it's a risk, right? Because we don't know when it's gonna be legal. We yeah. don't know, we don't know, um, really, there's not much that we know, but if you have a vision and you're committed to it and you say like, this is a, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, yeah. you know, and I love cannabinoids and even the Delta eight market and all of that, but all those products are like, boo, 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 fast. Oh, who's got the next one? Oh, Delta eight, Delta 10, this, that, that, no, this is really about like this long term, um, the mushrooms are, you know, there's over 400 compounds in them of which only seven that we know are active tryptamines. But imagine how many more Before there are. Before we go further, can you tell yeah. our listeners just in case they don't know what a tryptamine oh, is? Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, so tryptamines are, so psilocybin, psilocin, um, the more known ones, um, DMT, there are the active ingredients that in, in these plants or mushrooms, they bind to our receptors. So the, so nobody quite knows exactly what causes the hallucinogen hallucinations, but the theory is there's these receptors that are H2A agonists. So they bind together like LSD binds with serotonin psilocybin, uh, sorry, psilocin binds with serotonin. When you look at the molecules, it's the exact copy. It's the same. They just, they bind together and then they activate in the brain. So what we've been doing at ACS laboratory is we've been developing a method to test mushrooms for these tryptamines. And a lot of it is trial and error, and we have to receive our samples from other DEA licensed facilities, and there are not many of them. There's only like three or four that have been allowed by the U.S. government, whether, well, actually, that's not true. I shouldn't say there are three or four. There's probably many more now because of all the research that's going on. So we, you receive the materials to test, and then you start doing all these different tests, and then um, comparing our method with other methods. So what does this do? It allows us to measure the potency of the mushrooms so that we start to understand how the different species could affect us. How potent is a chocolate versus just the fruit versus a microdose? You know, when we talk about well, so far, like as we've been talking about mushrooms, it's all about the weight. But what does that mean? Yeah. yeah. I, what's in there? Well, and all so different mushrooms have different all, potencies. That's right. That's right. And so I think that's really the beginning of an industry when you can understand what's in it, how potent is it, how does it compare to these other strains? And then I'm going to call this the vehicle, right? The vehicle of delivery. How does that compare? You know, whether it's chocolate, whether it's whether it's extracted, whether it's, you know, so there's all these different things. Now, to add to that, so we all know that psychedelic mushrooms, and why do we call them psilocybin mushrooms? That's the other thing, like psilocybin is just one tryptamine. It's like calling mm -hmm. cannabis THC cannabis, like we wouldn't call it that. For sure. So it's, you know, we're in the beginning of an industry, but it's really important how we language things, you know, so that we don't make the same mistakes that cannabis made. Um, you know, and then there's the whole debate synthetic versus natural, which is kind of like I, that was the panel that I spoke on at Wonderland with, um, with Rick Doblin and some other people. And, you know, they were talking about how they're not sure if there's an entourage effect in mushrooms. And an, the entourage effect, for those that don't know, it means that that one isolated molecule by itself is not as powerful as all of the other active ingredients that are in that plant or in that mushroom. So it's like saying, 
um, THC is the only thing that matters in cannabis, as opposed to the fact that there's THC, CBD, CBG, that they all have an entourage effect. The same thing with mushrooms. Psilocybin is not the most important ingredient. There's psilocin, biocystin, nor biocystin, nor psilocin, you know, there's all these other ones. So there's, so in studies, if they're just using synthetic psilocybin, that's great because it's progress. And if that's what they can do, that's important. And for the FDA approval process, they can only work with one or two ingredients. But if we really want to be fair to the mushroom, I mean, look at how many others there are. And people have been using these mushrooms for thousands of years. So are we really that night confident in this? Yeah, that one? was my you know, question. It's Is like, that, are you testing mushrooms? from the ground or are you testing synthetic mushrooms? So right now it's just been mushrooms, regular I, mushrooms. I, see, yeah. I love, I love that because the fact is, is that like, like for the medicinal properties of cannabis, if I was going to use cannabis as a medicine, which I like, I really don't use cannabis anymore, but like I would go after a full spectrum for the right. medicinal properties because you have that entourage effect with everything. And I think that's a really important study and information to be found out because the truth is, is that, you know, if you're just giving somebody like, like THC is the psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, which gets us high, but for the actual medicinal properties, I mean, that could probably help with some depression and anxiety, et cetera. But when you're talking about, you know, taking this thing for like, like Rick Simpson oil, which was what Masha tapped in on earlier, like that would be a full spectrum. It has all the alkaloids from the plant in it. It has this entourage effect, which probably makes the medicinal value, in my opinion, much greater. Um, I think that that's something that really does need to be studied because, you know, listen, I'm a fan of whatever works. I, I like, you know, sin, like we do ketamine, ketamine is not natural. I get it. It's synthesized right. in a laboratory, but it's very effective medicine. That's right. And, and the thing is, is that I'm a fan of whatever works, but right. I'm also a fan of nature and a fan of nature getting things right, you know, and then it yeah. usually does until we step in and do something wrong. And I think that this need this information needs to be known because like you said this is major progress with the clinical studies that are being done with psilocybin etc but if we need to go back to the plant somehow and figure out how to utilize this properly and get that pushed through an FDA approval, which would probably, you know, be like, like one of the probably the most hard, hard things to do on the planet, the hardest things to do on the planet. I think that the, this information is really pertinent. It is. It is. And um, I think depending on the groups of people, right, there's starting to be a divide, this divide in the psychedelic industry. There's like the people that are that are looking at how the indigenous uh, tribes and, you know, the indigenous uh, societies have used these plants and kind of bringing that meaning as opposed to, you know, big pharma or corporate America. And now, you know, there's talk of IP and, you know, that's a whole other topic. It's very polarizing. And unfortunately, um, you know, look at where cannabis is with the divide and, you know, it's, it's, it's a plant that was grown. If it's grown craft with love that the terpenes express themselves and it's beautiful, but if it's like stressed and all they care about is production and, and, you know, getting it on the shelves, it just, it changes the game. So with, I mean, with all psychedelics, we have the opportunity to create a roadmap. At, hopefully that will be more successful, you know, than what's happened with cannabis. The other thing that's really interesting, I think is there's what we don't know is that. So for example, with mushrooms, um, when they're extracted, that's, it's a more exact measurement, you know? So now when you're working with extraction, you can figure out dosing, you can figure out how to get that, the same, to, to get the same product each time, you know, to get the consistency each time. And so like honey is an amazing way to extract like there's so many things that we don't know that i'm just learning you know from uh, the mycology community is super open to like they'll share spores you know they'll be like hey you know try these or this is it, and that is just amazing 
how open some of that the mycology community is because that doesn't happen with cannabis. Nobody's like, hey, look at my genetics. Let's jam. They don't do that. You know, nobody, everyone grows the best weed. You know, I got the best, uh, but this is, it's different. So it, we see the shift happening in that it's more about community and it's more about um, sharing from others. And when it comes to lab testing and sharing the science, that's what I'm committed to. You know, I, I want to be able to talk about what we're doing and, and share the science, share the results say, look at how these 10 things tested and look at how it compares to, um, you know, the fruit compares to the chocolate compares to the extract, you know, do shelf life studies. How long can you keep it? Where do you keep it? What's so like all these things, but it's an evolution. You know, we, we, we start in this small place and then we keep, we kind of keep building from there. So, um, I think what you were saying is like really important about the actual community aspect of this and not to polarize anything. And, you know, it's like, I mean, in my opinion, like that's what psychedelics is all about. It, it like, it's about bringing everyone together and realizing that this is about, you know, helping assist humanity, not trying to monopolize anything or, right. or, you know, or hide this kind of stuff. And, you know, I think that, I think when it comes to the actual, like what you're talking about with the fruit or the mushroom and the actual synthetics and stuff, I think that people should always have the options. You know, that's why I'm yeah. actually, I'm a fan of, and when I say this, please make sure you realize I'm talking about places that are vetted and with the right people. Yeah. But like a good friend of ours, Greg Lake, he's, you know, he just set a church of uh, silo, silomethoxin up. And, and basically it's like, it's a mushroom that they feed some sort of substrate to or whatever. And it ends up regurgitating some sort of DMT and it, but, but it's a church that he actually has where they're taking the actual mushrooms and they're eating them. And the thing is, is that like, I think that with what you're going into, like it's, that was when I was like, when I was growing up or when I was using, you know, psilocybin or different kinds of mushrooms, I would always be like, well, so what dose are you taking? Oh, right. I'm taking three grams. Oh, I'm taking five grams. Right. But what does that really mean? Exactly. You know, because it's like, you know, the next batch you get, you might take three grams or you might take five grams. And then the next thing you know, you're having a completely different kind of experience that might not be anywhere near as intense. So I think that actually getting this to the place where you can do something like this to actually figure out what accurate doses of the medicine yes. are it yes. is actually like probably one of the more important things that's happening right now. Absolutely. And figure out like the use case, right? So mushroom chocolate. So four squares equal a three hour art exhibit. You know what I mean? Like, like, just like yeah. figuring out the use case so that people aren't like, because set and setting, everybody talks about set and setting, but it's, it's not all created equal. You know, it depends. It depends. Like, um, travel could be fun again, like not stressful, <laughs> you know, but, but what, what I'm saying though is, uh, yeah, I think the use case that people need navigation, you know, the same way you guys, what what you're doing with my self wellness and the way that you really take care of people when they come in and you know you set them up you tell them what to expect but you're with them you know so that they know what they're going to get end to end and that's the definition of a brand really right is you're consistently delivering that experience every time so if people don't know what to expect and if it's different every time you know, there's a there's good a chance of harm that could be done. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Like and setting up protocols for harm reduction to, yes. to do that because you don't know. I mean, somebody is just, oh, this is great. I've been hearing about psilocybin chocolates. They go somewhere, they get a whole bar of chocolates. It says one to two squares is a micro dose and you take that and then it's definitely not a micro dose. <laughs> exactly. And that's, you know, it's interesting about chocolate is that even the potency number could say very little, but it could still knock you, like blast you because chocolate has flavonoids in it that have an entourage effect that mix with the, it's that there's like a carrier, there's something, some sort of a catalyst in it. We're not sure what it is, but again, that's why you look at like, like in South America where the cacao is indigenous, you know, to the, 
to the land. And then it's very, they do ceremonies with that and the mushrooms. So there's so much history there and so much we could learn. Chocolate is super interesting. And honey is an amazing extractor. It's a preservative and but how much, right? There's so much we don't know. It's, so, it's yeah. funny that you actually brought that up because recently I had been hearing about uh, psilocybin honeys and I was kind of confused. Somebody told us about I, MDMA I, honey yeah, too. I was, I was kind of confused. I, I Yeah, I don't think that's a natural extraction. <laughs> right? I think somebody's just throwing MDMA and honey on that one. But 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 um, it, it, it's actually really uh, interesting to hear about how you can actually extract the medicine out of the, the, the plant matter by putting it in honey you're saying yes yeah you just pop it in honey let it sit for a while and then yeah very interesting it is interesting you know citizen scientists we got to try stuff on ourselves too <laughs> psychedelic research we, we, we actually we had a, we had one of our clients come in recently and it was for his first treatment and he was wearing this shirt that said psychedelic researcher on it i love it <laughs> i thought I it was it. fantastic yeah, something so that we'll actually talk about another time um, on the show but we actually had this guy was a veteran and he had a tbi and it's crazy. We we need to get more data put together on it, but there's a distinct possibility that we actually could have physiologically healed this guy's brain because he had scans done like six weeks before he started his treatments. And after four treatments in, he had other scans done. And the doctor's like, wait a second, <laughs> like what's going on? I don't see any damage anymore. And so there's a distinct possibility that the yeah. ketamine actually went he in and healed TBIs. his brain. Three TBIs. Yeah. I'm sorry. So wow. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. So. I think the great, the brain scans, that's, that's the proof. It's so important. Yeah. You know, no. here they put someone on antidepressants for 10 years. You think they ever do a brain scan? Nope. Yeah. It's crazy. So no, for sure. So, so my, yeah. so my, so my uh, last question for you would be today, if you could give a message to our listeners or to humanity, like what would your message be? I know that's a big question. Hot seat, but question. Hot seat question. I would say that, you know, we are, our memories are stored in, in our body, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody really knows where long-term memory is. We think it's somewhere in the body. Our body is 80% water. You know, the pain, pain, anxiety, all that, that's stored in our body. And but in our DNA, so we have so much knowledge and we have so much memory and we have instinctually, there are things that we know how to do. We are built for greatness. And so I think our job is to peel away the layers, get to that greatness, listen to your gut. You know, I would say that we're all here for a reason and we're all guided and you have to just Clear away the noise and ask yourself, what lights me up? What do I need to heal myself? And then, and then do that and but be that. consistent, you know, be consistent. And it could be small things like 1% better each day, you know, just do something each day, you know, yeah. and, but really listen to your gut because we are all called. So hear that. I love yeah. it. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners for journeying with us today on this edition of Psychedelic Radio. You can download our past episodes of our program by going to CannabisRadio.com or by subscribing to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. To learn more about the Warriors of Consciousness, please follow us on social media and go to WOCFund.org and watch the videos. If nobody's told you that they love you lately, we, we do. do. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.